Good afternoon and welcome back to Heritage HQ and our latest Heritage Live. Today's guest is Indonesian marine conservationist, whale shark whisperer and manta ray researcher Abraham Sianapa. Every week is Shark Week for Abram, as he's known to his friends, who is currently completing his master's degree at Mur Murdoch University on whale shark ecology. He's also worked with Conservation International Indonesia for the past decade, leading and building their shark and ray conservation program from the ground up. Abram joined us on Indonesian Explorer last year, and I was lucky enough to travel with him. And we are super excited to welcome him here back today as a guest lecturer and guide again in October. Welcome, Abram. Good to see you, my friend, and thanks for joining us. Hi, Isaac. Um, yeah, hey. very excited to be back here uh, in, in Heritage uh, Facebook Live, but also going to be back on, on the ship uh, later in the year. Good stuff. Okay, let's get into it. Um, as always, if you guys have any questions, we'll um, loop back at the end if we have time. So ask away in the comments. Um, so I guess we should start at the start. How does a, a young boy who grew up um, in the mountains of West Java um, end up crusading for whale sharks and manta rays and a bunch of other sharks? Uh, it's, it's my, I think my, my career journey, is, uh, it's just uh, been a dream come true. Uh, to be honest with you, and I'm, I'm quite lucky in my journey to meet very, a lot of good people that put a lot of trust in myself and, you know, and, and that kind of like how it becomes. But I think early in my younger days, I was always kind of like fell in love with uh, the natural world uh, naturally for me. Uh, naturally for me, living in, in Bandung, which is a landlocked city that's surrounded by ranges of mountains, uh, most of my outdoor activities in nature revolves around going out in the forest and also kind of like hiking with my friends, camping with my friends, uh, dirt bike riding and, and things like that. So uh, it's it's very much a, di a different a different thing uh, back then. But, you know, going out and spending my time in nature always been been a part of myself uh, since my younger days. And I'm quite lucky when I attended university, I took a major in biology. And I think in my third year, I was uh, doing an internship in uh, NGO in Bali, in Rilchek, Indonesia. Uh, and that's kind of like when I first fell in love with the ocean, fell in love with snorkeling, uh, introduced to diving, which I also fell deeply in love with. And that kind of like changed my course of direction uh, to the marine world for me at that point. And I, uh, a colleague of mine kind of like suggested me a crazy idea back then to, to do my undergrad thesis about studying about sharks, because at that time, I don't think there's any students in Indonesia that study sharks. Uh, most of the sharks that studied in Indonesia are mostly based in fishing markets where shark are landed. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, I think, one of the I'm I'm quite the one of those lucky ones that started to study sharks and their natural behavior in Indonesia, and I got the chance to do that with the support of Conservation International in their lovely field work site that I later on called almost my second home in the field, Raja Ampat. And during that time, I studied a lot of these. Uh, guys, the black tip reef sharks and a bunch of other reef sharks for my undergrad thesis. And then after I graduated, I also applied to Conservation International and they are also generous enough to accept me. And at that point, I don't know, I'm doing a lot of focused on shark and ray conservation and shark and ray research, but that's kind of like the beginning of Conservation International Indonesia's Shark and Ray Conservation Program at the time, which focuses on this beautiful manta rays. Excellent. And so in those early days, what was um, what were your friends and family thinking? Because you were obviously pioneering sort of this research in Indonesia without going, what's this guy up to? Oh, it's for my family, it's what I do is something unheard of because my family comes from a from a traditional Indonesian family that works in, you know, Indonesian companies. My mom is a professor is in a university. My dad is a work in, you know, big Indonesian companies. So 
for me working in first is an in an NGOs and second doing research and doing a lot of this you know cool field research thing is it's quite unheard of for my family because this is something that they they only you know see in in films and in <laughs> you know discovery channels or the national geographic or bbc and things like that so at first there was just really uh, you're you're doing that and you get getting paid to do that i was like well yeah and and i i absolutely love it right and uh what's not to love <laughs> Exactly. And and this is at the point where for most of my peers as a young Indonesians coming off of university, a lot of us have, have the vision or have a dream to, you know, either study abroad or living abroad or working abroad, right? But for me, spending a lot of these times in Indonesia, in, in the in the most beautiful part of Indonesia, in the eastern Indonesia in Papua, uh, yeah. I lost the taste to, to be wanting to go abroad because now I realize what's underneath my countries is very, very special indeed. And, and not a lot of people actually knows that and get to spend this time with, with this amazing creatures. I think that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a dream. And it's an underwater world. So it's almost like you're abroad anyway, because where is it exactly. so far and remote? Um, so can you tell us about your early encounters um, and how these magnificent creatures sort of won your heart and made you go into bat for them? Yeah, and one of the first ones that does it for me is the manta rays. And, and you know, I later on work more with whale shark uh, and with manta rays and other sharks as well. But manta rays, I think the ones that does it first for me anyways, because <laughs> with manta rays, they're so special. and you know, this is a cleaning station in Raja Ampat where they go to this special part of the reef to get their body cleaned by this cleaner fish. And we could just spend hours here while, while the, the manta rays is being cleaned. But manta rays, they, they have something special in them. They, they do have a, a largest brain to mass, body mass ratio compared to all fish. And they're fish, right? Yeah. With, with like dolphins and whales, they're marine mammals. So they do have a more complex brain and have social function and et cetera. But if you think about a manta ray as a fish, they are the smartest fish in the ocean. And when we're in underwater with them, you can felt that they know of our presence mm -hmm. and they, they actually try to try to gauge us and they, they, they try to understand what we are, what, what are these kind of like bubble makers doing underground in, in, in their home? Right. And when we are in the underwater with manta rays, when they get very close to us and we can see their eyes, we can actually see their eyes moving around and try mm -hmm. to recognize us. Yeah. And and, and, and you you could just felt that underwater. And, and that's I think that's that's very special to me. And uh, I'm quite lucky when, when I first joined Conservation International in 2013, the Indonesian government at the time have a commitment to wanted to do their first effort in protecting shark and rays. And one of them, mm -hmm. uh, one of the species that they focused on is the manta rays. Uh, whereas the manta rays, we first, we don't know uh, a lot of their uh, behavior and also information about their movement because we kind of like know that they could go uh, do a long distance migrations, but we don't know how far because Indonesia is a large country, right? And we don't know in, in what sort of waters that they spend their time traveling to, whether it's it's a safe haven like in Raja Ampat or uh, Bali or Komodo where tourism is flourishing or in some of the other places where they're actually being actively hunted at the time. And unfortunately in Indonesia at the time, there's a couple of places that actually hunts them uh, for traditional reasons, uh, but they're raking up quite a numbers and Manta rays, as a part of shark and ray family, also have a very slow growth and reproduction. So mm -hmm. these fisheries actually could drive their local population towards extinction. And we, we then work with the Indonesian government to collect some information and uh, mm -hmm. collate that and to basically work also with the local communities and 
in Raja Ampat, the local government in Raja Ampat, and band together to actually make a bandwagon to to protect mentories in Indonesia. And quite luckily, one of the one of the big thing that Indonesian government also like to hear is that mentories is this massive icon for the underwater tourism industry. And I think one of the papers that our colleagues uh, uh, published in 2013 is that one, a single manta ray have could worth up to $1 million throughout its lifetime. And it, it has kind of like a, a $1 million manta tagline. So what when it compared to the value that they get from when they catch them and then they sell all of those parts, uh, either for the meats for traditional use, or also at the time there's an increased demands from China to use their dried gills for one of the ingredients for their traditional medicines. But all in all, one manta rice could probably uh, value it around $500. And when you compare that and put that in the table, the answer is kind of obvious, right? And then the government kind of like eventually take a bold step to protect the manta rays and Indonesia has become uh, the, the largest kind of like countries, I think, to protect manta rays in their millions of acres of uh, hectares of waters uh, in its territory. So it sounds like you had to get the community involved as well. Obviously, um, money is coming into the community as well through the tourism. How did you get those yep. people on board? Was it enough to say, well, this is the value that these manta rays can contribute to you alive as opposed to the one-off cost. Yeah, and and uh, I also, I think a part of my work by, by spending a lot of time in the field, I also spend a lot of time in the communities as well. And we, we do share some of our, a lot of our research that we did uh, with the communities as well. And they are the ones that, that at, in the end, we would really would like to benefit uh, from, from these species. and. This is one of the ideas that we wanted to push forward uh, either for the government of Indonesia and also elsewhere that some of the species actually worth far more alive and when we could, could, could secure their protection and keep them safe, keep them happy where they are uh, compared to when they're dead. And the communities, especially in Raja Ampat, they, they really see the benefit in that because when, when I talk, especially with elders, uh, in the villages in Raja Ampat, they they know this manta rays because the manta rays has been swimming in their waters since they since they were a kid, since they know how to how to swim in the water. And some of these manta rays in one of the village, the manta rays even swim close to their the village's jetty. And now they see something that they always see in front of their village being valued so high and makes people from all over the world came to visit their village, their areas, and, and that gives them an immense sense of pride, but also they, they felt the economic benefit of having these people come to their village, spending money in their village to stay in their homestays and yeah. paying for dive trips and, and things like that. And this protection has also been rolled out to whale sharks as well? Yes, so with the whale shark, they have uh, been protected uh, earlier in 2013. Uh, which basically have the same argument as well. Mm -hmm. With whale shark, they do also have a lot of values for tourism. Uh, but with the whale shark, the difference in, in, in the Indonesian case for whale shark and manta rays, manta rays are more heavily hunted at that time compared to the whale shark. Whale shark, uh, luckily for us, uh, their, their fins doesn't really value that high it's basically worthless uh, uh, within kind of like the shark fin trade industry. They only oh, yeah. usually use that for decoration because they wanted oh. to have a big fins to decorate in their, in their restaurant or anything. But the, the fins itself, uh, it, it doesn't have any values for the uh, shark fin industry for the shark fin soup. So uh, oh. we're lucky on that side, but there's still one or two communities that hunts well shark uh opportunistically so there's a, a couple of hardcore fishing villages uh that that really rely a hundred percent of their livelihoods from the sea that actually hunts 
megafaunas uh, in the waters with their harpoons. And unfortunately, whale sharks are is one of those animals that passes through their waters and mm -hmm. hunts it. But uh, the number is it's it's very low. It's it's very subsistent and with you know with outreach programs and and more knowledge to these communities uh we can really make a difference in that side but men's race even though they 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 hide behind the arguments of traditional fishings but when you see the numbers a thousand men's race being caught in a year but in one village it's it's a little bit crazy mm. so Absolutely. and yeah so the that's that's kind of like the two side between between these two species, but yes, they do both fall into say, the same kind of like category of endangered, but highly valuable uh, to our tourism's uh, Alaska yeah. practice species. And that's and that's the message we need to keep sharing. So, um, how important are Indonesian waters for these species? Um, it looks like there's nurseries and other and cleaning stations, et cetera, for these, some of these transient animals. Um, and what role do these waters play in their um, life cycle? Yeah, so this, this megafaunas, uh, marine megafaunas, they, they, they're known by the, obviously they're the big, big size and with their big, big size, uh, but also with manta rays and whale shark, they do eat a lot of a more planktonic kind of like prey. In in whale shark in in whale shark's case, they do eat smaller fishes, such as anchovies, but not not manta rays. But yeah. with this megafaunas and they having them spend their time a lot of their time in Indonesian water, that means they are a, a bio indicators of a healthy ocean. Mm -hmm. I don't think they will they will reside anywhere where the ocean is not healthy, and would not be able to provide enough food for them to sustain their life be, by staying there, and then. We see that kind of like also even in Australia, it is sometimes or, or New Zealand, some of this megafauna can be found, but seasonally, because in different seasons, you get a different kind of like density of food and, and things like that. But in Indonesia, we are kind of blessed in having a couple of places that we see them throughout the year, like in whale shark, for in case, uh, in Chandrawasi Bay, in West Papua, and also in Sale Bay, in Sumbawa, at least that two of the you know, year-long population of whale shark that we heavily studied and, and we see that they're there all the time. Uh, and we kind of like see that it's because the benefit of the of the healthy ocean that Indonesia have and Indonesia also is quite strategically placed between these two massive ocean of the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And also there's this Indonesian through flow currents that brings a lot of nutrient uh, in between the nooks and crannies of the Indonesian, the chain of islands within Indonesia itself, that makes it viable for this uh, species to spend their time around. Okay. Um, and if we were to look back at their life cycles um, from your studies in that, are there still some questions? Are there still some unknowns about them? Or do we kind of know a lot about them or a little? Oh, yeah, for sure. There's, there's, plenty of things that we don't know about these these animals and and that what makes it exciting for us and for our work uh but also one of the things that makes us scratch our heads at night before we went to bed you know because mm. at the at the end of the day we wanted to protect these uh these animals uh we wanted to protect the potential of the economic benefit that these animals could give to the communities in Indonesia but we need to know their 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 life cycle, we need to know much more about their biology and ecology in order to best protect them. With manta rays, uh, we discovered that in the past, I think back in 2016, some of our satellite tagging programs revealed that uh, the, the Wayag islands in, in Raja Ampat is actually the nursery for them. Mm -hmm. uh, because we do see kind of like some of the pregnant females going up to Wayak, and we we do see some of the some of the pup that we we know for sure is just recently got have been birthed by their by their moms. They're staying around within the lagoon, and they might stay there for a year or so. So that area serves an important kind of like habitat for these uh, animals in Raja Ampat as a birthing place, but also we 
think about it as a as a nursery for the young pups that that just being got birth there. With whale shark, it's it's much more mysterious. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, like uh, also in other kind of like fossil aggregation of whale shark that we see around the world, it's dominated by male individuals and younger male individuals. And we, we rarely see the females uh, within those size range, uh, between three to nine meters that we still consider young. We rarely see the adults in Indonesian waters. We also have never, I think, see some of these newborn ones because whale shark, when they were born, they were born in the size of around 75 centimeters. But the, the smallest animals that we see, it's all probably around 2.5 or 2.8 meters. And you know th those smaller animals, we never see them. And the bigger animals, we never see them as well. So we kind of like postulated maybe the Indonesian waters also other kind of like coastal irrigation of welfare, they use that as a as a nursery for the young. So maybe they were when they're big enough to to travel the, the big ocean they were left and, and you know roam around the the vast ocean of the world because they basically don't have anything that could hold them uh, other than kind of like the, the need to, to eat basically. Right. Is it is it almost like teenagers going to Cancun or somewhere like that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, and, and that is also one of the things that drive us also to keep on doing some of our some of our tagging works. And we do a lot of uh, satellite taggings, we do a lot of acoustic taggings. This is one of the pictures when we put an acoustic trackers on a manta race, and we do put some acoustic receivers down in Raja Ampat. So I we am... can see if if the manta rays get close to those receivers and and ping those uh, receivers and we know where they are. Okay, excellent. I do have um, a question on tagging. I understand that you've pioneered some pretty epic tagging programs over the years, yep. Indonesia-wide for manta rays, but also um, attaching the, the tagging to whale sharks, which is um, it's a non-damaged one and it will actually naturally grow out of the fin. Um, yep. How has this helped your research and their conservation? Oh, it's it helps us immensely. And it's quite funny that uh, this came to be by by the the accidental kind of like occurrence of the whale shark being spending a lot of time around this bagan leafnet fisherman in Indonesia, uh, where they also often get accidentally caught in the net. And we talk about it with the fishermen when they actually the fisherman told us told us all the time where when the the whale shark get caught in the net they was just like sleeping inside of the net and, and you can see in this picture because they just basically rest on in the bottom of the net but it's like resting in a hammock and then they could just stay there for hours and and they're not stressed they're not you know they're not kind of like feel their life are threatened and and this thing is actually kind of like that gives us an idea well if we can do this, we can actually go inside of the net, you know, mm -hmm. and then and then put a satellite tags on it. Because before, a lot of the whale shark researchers in the world have done 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 a lot of satellite taggings for whale shark, but the issues is always on the tag retention, because whale shark, you know, all over the world kind of like also spend sometimes close close to these fisheries and close to the some of the human activities. And some of the tag that were put on the whale shark got entangled and got uh, took off from the body before they could collect the whole kind of like a good amount of data that, that the scientists need. Yeah. So with this kind of like uh, occurrence, we could basically catch the whale shark and put a satellite tag on them. Even in this picture, we could actually measure them uh, by the centimeters to the dot and which is again unheard of in anywhere else in the world. And this gives us an opportunity to deploy, as I mentioned, the, the fin mount tags that we fix directly towards the dorsal fin. Mm -hmm. uh, and luckily, and th this could give us a, a really long retention time for the tag. And then the tag, uh, we, we custom made the tag to have a big battery pack that could transmit the data up until two years. And throughout the years of doing this uh, tagging programs, we're quite lucky to, to see that and also quite happy to see that 
this tagging doesn't really do a lot of damage to the sharks. Uh, as you mentioned, the tag would eventually being pushed back by the currents and, and having the drag by having the whale shark swim all the time. And eventually after two and a half or three years, if we don't catch them again, they will fall off the tag completely. But we always aim to have our team on the ground after around two years, try to try to look for the tag animals to try to capture them again, to actually re recover the tag and, and release them from their fins. Okay. Um, you showed us the whale shark in the net before. Um, so unlike in, um, other sharks, they don't have to keep moving to keep the, the current going through their yes. gills. Is that right? Yeah. It's, it's quite a evolutionary. It's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite curious because you kind of like find this in some of these demersal sharks, like wobbegongs, like uh, tawny mm. nurse sharks, like the zebra sharks. And, the walking sharks and etc that that lives in the bottom of the oceans and yeah it's 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 a quite curious thing to and, and that is also again we we didn't think about that in the beginning yeah. before we talk about it with the fishermen and and that is always something that that has been kind of like my mo uh since uh the beginning of my work uh yeah. always 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 talk to the locals because they are there for you know uh, for how many years that I've lived, generations and generations of knowledge being passed through from their parents, from their grandparents. And yeah. we came there with, you know, kind of like a, a Western science perspective. And sometimes we don't respect that enough. But I think a lot of my work have proven that a lot of some of the ideas that we have that have been deemed original or innovative by the Western science is actually got you know came from or you know inspired by some of this kind of like interaction that I have and discussion that I have with uh, the local communities in Indonesia and also it's another great way to get them involved in your programs as well exactly exactly and buy in. Um, so has there been any sort of interesting or um, things that have blown your mind from the tagging and that I know whale sharks are also pretty impressive deep divers i mean how far can they go down and how long do they go down for and why so i think uh, for the whale shark they they the ones that we recorded at least 1800 meters mm -hmm. which is which is very deep yeah. it's a very deep and dark and cold water down there i think the coldest temperature that we recorded is four degrees celsius okay which is insane uh a couple and, and the, up and well before exactly and, and the the 1800 meters actually we, we still kind of like a little bit uh kind of like we think that they might dive deeper than that because in a couple of cases of our tags the the depth sensor got busted the depth sensor were rated to 2000 meters and we think yeah. that they might yeah go deeper than that and after that time we again have to modify our tag to to have to use a, a depth centers that have a wider kind of like also range and i think now the the newer ones that we had i think goes rated up until three thousand meters or something like that oh okay. and we'll we'll, we'll we'll see we'll see how it goes <laughs> but yeah this this guy's could, could go deep and uh i think so far uh what are these deep dives there they they do have a lot of uh, the scientists science community have a lot of kind of like a hypothesis on on what they might do uh, what are they doing down there why they dive uh, so deep i think so far the the most probable cause to, to do that is is to do for navigation purposes because uh they when they dive deep they are getting closer to the earth kind of like magnetic kind of like field and then they use yeah. that to navigate especially when they wanted to do kind of like a long distance migration when they wanted to have kind of like a better directional cue but in my my master's studies in indonesia we discovered that the whale shark i think at least spend spend a good amount of time in a deeper water but this is around 200 and 250 meters in Saleh Bay, 
but I think this is this is a specific salivary thing or probably a behavior specific thing where they actually feed on some of the deep scattering layer there. And they spend almost a full day. Uh, so in the morning they go down and then they spend almost 12 hours in that depth and probably not moving too much and just basically kind of like feeding on some of the foods that they found there. And that is, I think, one of the interesting findings that we had, which is quite uh, quite exciting and quite new. And we, we, we don't hear that before. And we, we, we're starting to put together a publication for that. Hopefully we could push that out soon. Uh, but that's kind of like a new, a new feeding behavior that we discovered in Indonesia, but that's, I don't think, have been recorded elsewhere. Okay, excellent. Um, and when you were in the net with the whale shark, I guess that was when you performed the world's first wild whale shark health assessment. Um, what were you, in addition to the measurements in that, um, what else were you doing, checking up on? So <clears throat> it is basically, it's, it's quite a, quite an interesting thing to do. It's, it's basically a health checkup for the whale shark. It's some, the same way that we do our health checkup in the hospital, but unfortunately, because it's a whale shark, we have to like do this underwater. So like in this picture, you see me kind of like drawing bloods from the whale sharks. And then we have our teams uh, in, in the dinghy ready to bring some of these blood samples to a vessels, uh, a liveaboard vessels, then we repurpose their back decks as a as a field lab, basically to process these blood samples. And we we look at some of the components that we again we that we also see in, in humans, like a glucose level, kind of like the uh, the blood gases and kind of like blood pH and red red blood cell count, white blood cell count, and things like that. We want to see their health. And also, most importantly, in, in this assessment, we also wanted to see uh, their stress level. So we do a couple of tests. We, we do a couple of uh, blood draws before uh, the tagging. So when the sharks got already get, get captured in the net uh, and when they already settled down, we do a blood draw and then we do the tagging and then we do blood draw again, uh, post tagging and see kind of like the differences. And I think we're quite a lot happy with the results that the tagging itself doesn't really uh, kind of like seem to be a major stressor uh, for the whale sharks. And this technique is actually kind of like being developed by some of our colleagues in, in the aquarium worlds. And in this trip, we are collaborating with some for, folks from Georgia Aquarium, but they also developed this technique with some uh, folks from the Okinawa uh, Turami Aquarium in Okinawa. So this used to be done for the for the animals in captivity within the aquariums and we kind of like, uh, they bring it the methods and we test run it to, to, to see it, how it fares in, in the wild animals. And we're quite happy that to see the wild animals are doing much, much better, I think, compared to the, to the aquarium ones. I guess there's no surprises there. Were there any mm. surprises from the results that you received no not really i think uh we 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 see i think the result is very very good and i think we're quite happy with the results and this is something that we it is a bit rigorous to do uh as well because again in it in, in, it involves a lot of kind of like uh a lot of work in in setting up that field lab in the boat because the blood is uh, the blood sample is very is very Kind of like delicate we we wanted to process that immediately we have to like process that immediately i wanted to do this again in, in a couple of other places in indonesia because now that it has been proven successful uh in in chandrawasi bay but yeah we're, we're quite happy to see our, our animals are, are doing great and kind of like being kind of like captured in the net for a long time also doesn't seem to be a great stressor for for the animal and the tagging itself also doesn't really pose a great stressor we we kind of like have that that sense of you know tagging a whale shark putting a a, a, a tag on its dorsal fin it it like it like uh, uh, piercing a, a human ear 
But with this and result from this health assessment, we know for sure now that the tagging doesn't really possess any kind of like danger towards the whale shark. Okay, excellent. Um, on Indonesian Explorer, which you'll be joining us in October, we get to visit both um, Raja Ampat, Wayag, and Chindawashi Bay. Um, yep. What, what can guests expect when they go there? Uh, first of all, warm waters. That's what I also enjoyed uh, swimming <laughs> in, in that part of Indonesia because Oh, around here in Bali. And, and... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so warm waters, uh, beautiful coral reefs, and uh, you know some some chances to encounter this this magnificent ocean giants, and um, also some of the some of the prettiest coral reefs you'll ever see in the world, uh, and also abundance of fishes, and also a very uh, happy and hospitable peoples, local peoples around there. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely incredible. And the underwater world is insane. Um, when we were there last year, we caught up with an old friend of yours um, in Shindawashi Bay, Craigo. Um, yeah. What can you tell us about your relationship with him? Ah, Craigo is good. And Craigo, we, Craigo, we tagged him, I think, in, I think in 2017 or 20. Wow. 2018 or so ago. and Craigo I think did a pretty interesting kind of like forays out uh towards kind of like the the outside of the bay uh, a little bit towards the Pacific but not too far but again come back and mm -hmm. that is also one of the things that that shows you how how important of a place Chindrawasi Bay is and also some of these habitats is because with satellite taggings, it, it kind of like naturally, we, we kind of like naturally drawn into wanted to see, wanted to see kind of like this, you know, amazing tracks of 10,000 or 20,000 kilometers forays across the Pacific. But yes, they kind of like do that, but they eventually comes back. And th that says a lot about Tundrawasi Bay as a habitat. And I think the importance of that habitat for this whale shark and kind of like reminded Kind of like me myself as an Indonesian to, to cherish these areas and also to to do kind of like our part to, to make sure this area is being properly protected and and we keep them as is so it could be still always be a healthy and habitat for these well sharks. And have you seen Craigo recently? Unfortunately no. So okay. it's not that Craigo ha hasn't been seen. I haven't had the chance to come back to Chundrawasi since we're together in the heritage. Oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, so this trip uh, this year going to be kind of like uh, my chance to to find Craigo again to see if we can you know hang out with with the heritage crew and the the heritage guest and yeah. Um, yeah, Craigo had a massive impact on with everybody on board. I think we all left yeah. with Craigo crushes. Um, yeah. <laughs> you were able to um, identify him through the, his markings and spots. Um, how do you? How, what's that technique known as, and how foolproof a method is it? I think it is. Uh, it is quite foolproof. I think a lot of people have have kind of like since it has been. It is kind of like been published. I think wrong. 2008 or 2009 and a lot of scientists have been using it and been testing it and it is it is quite foolproof uh where these spot pattern won't change uh the, the more that they grow they might stretch us here and there but the, the pattern itself won't, won't change and this is kind of like has been the backbone of i think all a lot of people and almost all people that works with whale sharks and mantra race uh, for that matter as well, uh, because this is the, the simplest part of the work that we can do. Just take picture on the side, because again, if we're spending time with this amazing giants underwater, we, we ought to have our cameras anyway, right? And to take pictures of them. And just knowing to take uh, the pictures of for a whale shark kind of like this left side of the body and the right side of the body, and with this spot pattern, scientists can basically compare them in the database, the global database, and, and see where these animals have been previously been seen. And this is kind of like have been 
the a network of collaboration globally for scientists of in terms of whale sharks and manta rays because yes we do they could do a long distance migration so, so it is kind of like only makes sense to do this globally and work with other scientists across across the globe to understand better about the the movement of of this amazing animal so kind of like our fingerprints yes exactly and this also helps us to to track kind of like when we're tagging is who are we tagging and you know doing by doing that we are also kind of like keeping a historical record of each animals like for instance there's this one animals that have uh kind of like a scar when we when we see them kind of like an open wound when we see them in 2015 and then if we continue monitoring that we can see kind of like throughout the months and throughout the years how the wounds kind of like healed and closed and kind of like the updates on the animals and so a lot of this work gave us a good kind of like historical information for each individual that we have as well excellent so on our voyage we are um have the privilege and um joy to swim with these magnificent creatures um what are some of the things that people should keep front of mind um when they're in the water with these enormous, um, beautiful, yet very gentle and very large animals? So for one, I always say keep calm. Uh, it is a little bit daunting and it is a little bit, uh, you know, it's it's an experience to spend, you, you know. An unforgettable some, Sometimes, yeah. We're talking about It's amazingly, amazingly unforgettable one because we talk about, when we talk about whale shark, we talk about their sizes as well. It's like, oh yeah, there's three meters, there's six meters, there's seven meters. But in underwater, all things appear larger than they are, right? Especially with mask and everything. So uh, a six meter whale shark, we can say that quite easily right now, but when you're actually in the water with a six meter whale shark, it is quite, quite amazing. And it's for pe some people, especially in their first few seconds, it, it's quite intimidating because these whale shark is a little bit also cheeky they always they likes to come up from from the bottom when they can see them that they open their mouth and felt like they wanted to eat you but worry not they won't they they like the smaller things but in chinawasi bay especially uh they do uh like to spend a lot of time close to these bagan fishermen uh where the fishermen feed them with anchovies and for us to spend our time there, we just basically stay calm, keep a safe distance, and try to not get in the whale shark's way, and try to always mind your surroundings, like your 360, uh, mm -hmm. to see if any whale shark crept up from behind you and make sure you're and not they in do. the way. <laughs> and they they kind of do. So, <laughs> and I always try, I always said to people like, well, try your best to maintain those three meter distances, but. Again, the whale shark also move around and they, they sometimes move closer to you and then you can only do so much. But I think I the first thing, if you're, problems. exactly. And and they are, when, when we're calmer and I think we can maneuver ourselves better uh, in the water as well. But again, do enjoy and yeah. I think I've, I've, I've never been kind of like, uh, bored or get tired of spending time in the water with them and they're <laughs> just so amazing so amazing and while you're on board what sort of research will you be undertaking so mostly i will do a lot of uh taking some of the photos uh kind of like adding to our records uh, for the individuals that we that we discovered uh kind of like encountered along the way uh, we'll see if if we see kind of like some of the animals that we tag that the tag seems to be not working that we could probably take off. Uh, it, it really depends on on which animals that we discovered in in our uh, in the voyage. Uh, but yeah, that's that's mostly it, I think, uh, because and that is something that uh, we could we could have a lot of help from having. A lot of cameras underwater as well by taking photos we we could collect that at the end of the day and and that could help our work and 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 adding the entries to our catalogs of photo ideas so there could be 
there is the potential to um, find a new animal, maybe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are you working on now? Um, I hear you've been involved in the re-shark release of baby zebra sharks into the wild. Yes, yes. So nowadays I'm uh, kind of like uh, working more and more uh, with these species, uh, but unfortunately not yet. Thingies. Yes. So, okay. <laughs> and we kind of like been together with this kind of like initiative called Resharks. It's a collaboration between uh, multiple kind of like organization between CI and University of Sunshine Coast in Australia and a couple of aquariums in the US uh, so far, mostly Georgia, Seattle, Shed, and, and etc. Uh, and we wanted to, to combine some of the ideas that we have that the zebra shark actually uh, could reproduce very well in the aquariums and produce a lot of eggs in the aquariums and in places like Indonesia, the zebra shark is quite depleted because they are kind of like mostly fished. And interestingly enough, the, the fishing of zebra shark always goes under the radar. No one notices that the shark's gone. But when you when you talk to people, to divers, to people that studies, uh, do marine science, they, they never see the sharks underwater. Very, oh. very rarely to see the sharks underwater. I myself never see them. Uh, in Raja Ampat, really? in, in how many dives, yeah, in how many dives I do in Raja Ampat. So, and also just the idea of having produced these eggs in the aquarium, bringing the eggs to Indonesia and release them, I think, and that's where the idea kind of like comes together and, and it sounded like it works very well for all parties involved because in Raja Ampat, for, uh, for instance, our conservation work, that has been done by Conservation International is very successful in uh, recovering the population of other reef sharks, like gray reefs, black tip reef, white tip reef, wabagongs, and almost every dive in Raja Ampat, you might see at least one sharks, and which is not the case back in 2006 or 2005, where kind of like a lot of shark fishermen are around and the shark were being all close to being decimated. But, even though other shark species recovered, for some reason the zebra shark not. So this this project kind of like gave us kind of like a good nudge and a more specific and more straightforward kind of like intervention to basically repopulate the whale shark, uh, the the zebra shark, uh, in Raja Ampat for one uh, for now and probably elsewhere uh, in its range. And yeah, we now have a have a hatchery uh, been built in Raja Ampat. This is some of our trusty oh, wow. folks from Papua kind of like paddling some of the water tanks uh, to the kind of like uh, hatcheries. And yeah, we, I think uh, in the past years, we have uh, successfully kind of like shipped eggs from a couple of uh, aquarium from Australia, uh, from Sydney. And a couple of them has hatched, which is very, very exciting. How many have you released so far? So far, we have released two. Okay. And they look like a zebra when they're um, juveniles, but then they look like um, something that's a bit more spotty when they get older. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, the, the zebra one, I think, uh, some scientists believe this is kind of like an act of mimicry. So they wanted to, probably they wanted to mimic the, the banded sea snake. Mm, yeah. So they are kind of like uh, predators don't want to kind of like eat them. And then they, they kind of like turn into a more leopard kind of like a spot pattern and colorations when they're yeah, kind of like yeah. bigger. And yeah, this is a, a very nice, I think, uh, kind of like we're, we're very lucky it's been also covered by the National Geographic kind of like a magazine about the, the first release that we did uh, with the sharks. And we did this last year and we're now working, uh, now that the, 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 the concept of it have been proven that we could bring eggs and produce eggs in the aquariums, bring it to Indonesia, hatch them in the hatcheries and and release them. Uh, we are now kind of like wanted to ramp up the production of eggs and eventually we wanted to repopulate 
the waters of Raja Ampat with these amazing sharks as well. Returning, restoring the um, natural balance. Um, what an incredible exactly. Often, I do have a question that's come up from um, Carmen Pang regarding zebra sharks, and she's asking what they're hunted for. Is it for fins for export, exotic pet trade, meat, possibly? Oh, uh, in Indonesia, at least uh, the ones that I've uh, heard from uh, talking to a lot of uh, a couple of fishermen that the that. To hunt them, they are mostly for all those things. So a combination of their fins, uh, me, I think I, I, I heard their skins has also been traded for some reason, uh, but also for, for uh, a live kind of like animal trade as well. But one of the things about zebra shark is that they they are very easily spotted by the fishermen. Right? They, they, they spend a lot of time kind of like sitting in the, in the sandy bottom uh not too deep of a water so the the people that i talked to in east kalimantan that hunts them they basically use a harpoons while snorkeling they could see them from their kind of like boat and then they could just dive kind of like a do a free dive and then just harpoon them and then they bring it up uh so in that sense i think that's why they they are very easily caught sometimes not even with a with a kind of like fishing lines and is, so is, this, is this campaign also working in with some of these communities that are hunting them to sort of like you're doing with the manta rays and the whale sharks? Are we uh, this is, I think we, we wanted to, this is uh, not yet, but we are still kind of like focusing on the Raja Ampat side where the there is a, a very effectively working MPAs in Raja Ampat. We wanted to do that. But with the success of this project, we wanted to build a momentum in Indonesia to eventually have them protected uh, within the countries and eventually working with those communities that actually hunts them uh, to work together to, to protect this uh, in, 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 the, in elsewhere in Indonesia in, in their ranges as well, so. Oh, okay, excellent. Well, that's something to look forward to and, and continue to watch. Okay, um, we're getting to the end of our time here. Um, how about um, as a local, um, what are your top tips for expedition cruising through Indonesia? Uh, I think uh, for me as a local, I think uh, the obvious is kind of like watch out for the sun. It is it is quite a quite a sunny country and it's quite a hot country. I, I do kind of like suffer a lot of sunburns during spending the time in the field. My mother sometimes doesn't recognize me because I was got burned so bad. Uh, <laughs> but you know, spend the time with the people and 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 talk with the with the locals and you know the people in Indonesia, especially those in the in the coastal Indonesia communities in Indonesia, they they are one of the most hospitable kind of like and and very welcoming people that I've ever met. Uh, and I've never been afraid to go anywhere in Indonesia to the especially coastal villages because they're traditionally very welcoming uh, with the history of kind of like sea trading and things like that. And, you know, the, the things that we could, you know, kind of like talk about and pick up the, some of the stories from their lives is, is quite magnificent sometimes. So you, it really ca caught you off guard sometimes. And, and also some of the wisdom that they have, some of the some of the funny stories that they had and, and some of their things that you can might relate it to, have related to, to your life, you know, living elsewhere. So yeah, I think that's that's my one thing uh, as, a, as a local to, to suggest. Yeah, absolutely. It's those cultural connections that really make the, mm -hmm. uh, make your voyage um, all that more better and, and more fleshed out and fully experienced. Um, Thank you so much for your time. We've answered our question, which is awesome. You're obviously clearly very thorough and um, people um, don't have any questions, which is great. That's uh, great. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you're an incredible ambassador for Indonesia's marine life and um, we're very lucky to have you on board. If you would like to join ABIM in October, we have a couple of specials at the moment. So it's US $1,000 discount or New Zealand and Australia $1,500. Um, per person flight credit for that voyage. Um, 
yeah, that's us. That's another Heritage Live and another incredible interview with another incredible person doing amazing things in the world. Thank you so much for your time, Abram. Um, I'll see you next time and take it easy, my friend. All right. Pleasure, Isaac. Bye. See you, buddy.